Thank you. So I'm David, a uh, fourth year PhD student at the University of London, physics department, not the maths, as uh, Marika and Mariam. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the double copy and its classical limit. So first of all, I need to tell you about the double copy because you might not be uh, familiar with this. Uh, it was a uh, duality that appeared in the context of sketching amplitudes in 2010. And the main idea is to recast gravity as the tensor product of two gauge theories. So in this slide, I'm going to give you, first of all, a four point three level example of how it works and also the general case. But let's start with the, with the first one, with the simple one. So consider a four point three level amplitude in, in the, a gauge uh, theory, let's say Young Mills. You have those four diagrams, uh, the S, T, U channels on the contact term. You can write this amplitude as this, where I'm gathering terms according to the propagators, basically the channels. This one you can divide into these three, well, this one contributes to uh, all three terms. And the Cs are color factors, which include uh, structure constants and the generators of the gauge group, for example. Whereas N uh, corresponds to the kinematic factors, which are uh, objects that are made out of uh, polarization vectors and the momentum. Now, the Cs are not only independent from each other because they are structure constants, which means that they satisfy the Jacobi identity. What is remarkable is that the new kinematic uh, factors also satisfy the same identity. And so they're basically on the same footing, which motivates us to replace the color factors by another set of numerators of uh, kinematic factors. And if you do that, you get an object that is invariant under different morphisms. And in fact, it's a three level amplitude of a gravitational theory. So let's now do the same thing for a more generic amplitude where we cannot divide the thing. Well, we, I can uh, tell you which diagrams we have because it's just um, a generic amplitude. Uh, but we could also write it like this, where now we have to sum over diagrams, we have to integrate over uh, loop momenta and we have the same factors. We have the color factors again, and the kinematic factors, although this time they would look uh, differently, of course. But again, the CIs are not going to be independent because they, they are uh, constrained by algebraic identities. The very non-trivial fact is that uh, you can always, or is, uh, it, it turns out that you can always rearrange the diagrams and the gauge in such a way that the kinematic factors satisfy the same algebraic identities. And this is called the color kinematics duality. Using this fact, then we're in the same position as before in which we can replace the color factors by uh, kinematic factors, rendering uh, L loop endpoint uh, gravitational amplitude. So again, uh, let me emphasize that as we see here, we, we are doubling up the kinematic uh, degrees of freedom from gauge theory to obtain a gravitational theory. But we want, uh, I want to study this in a classical setting. So does this have any implications for classical gravity? It turns out that it does. And one realization of this is the Val double copy. I'm going to talk about spinners because they are the, the relevant objects. They are equivalent of uh, the scattering amplitudes in, in, in the previous slide. Uh, again, as, as, Mar as Marika introduced, uh, in the previous talk, we have the Maxwell spinner, which is just heating uh, the F mu new tensor with some Pauli matrices, and the Weyler spinner. The spinners are quite nice because they also allow us to classify solutions. So for example, in the Maxwell spinner can be classified in type one and type two, depending on the multiplicities of the fundamental spinners. And you can do the same thing for the Weyler spinner. Let us now focus on type one Maxwell spinners and type D Weyler spinners. You, you kind of notice here that uh, the type D Weyler spinner is like two copies of the Maxwell spinner. And let me, let me be more precise. Consider type D Weyler spinner, which we can write like this. The Omicrons and Yotas are normalized. So that's why I'm taking this factor uh, outside. And uh, type one Maxwell spinner. If we take phi one, to be psi two to the power of two over three. And we take a scalar field, which is the remaining power of, uh, of psi, or psi, uh, psi two to the one third, then something remarkable happens. If 
psi satisfies the Bianchi identity, which is the equation of motion uh, of, of the valve spinner, then automatically phi and ness satisfy the Maxwell equation of motion and the vacuum uh, wave equation. So here we are again rendering the relation of gravity as the square of gauge theory. And uh, these form, well, these relations are written such that you can write the, the vial spinner as phi phi over s, which is very re reminiscent of the, uh, of the the oh, sorry of the double copy uh, relation that we discussed uh, in the previous slide. Uh, but this was known already from 2018. But so you can ask something else. Notice that for type n space times, we kind of have a similar thing with type two Maxwell spinners. Again, it's like the double copy. So that's what we've done. If you take type n Maxwell spinner and type n uh, Weyl spinner, and you take S to be a solution of this equation, which always exists, then you have the same thing. If you define psi two to be the square root of psi four uh, times S, you can still write psi as this combination. And again, if psi four solves the equations of motion, you have a phi two that automatically solves the Maxwell equations. Uh, and uh, this is very interesting because type N solutions are, are quite uh, quite interesting. You have cone solutions, Robinson Trotman solutions, and twisting solutions. They basically correspond to gravitational waves. Also, for the twisting solutions, the interpretation of a double copy is a bit uh, a bit subtle. Uh, and here, well, the main difference with respect to type these space times is that now S might have a bit more freedom. You might have uh, some functional degrees of freedom since it is not uh, precisely uh, obtained from psi four. Let's now think about something else. So now that we've uh, developed this map between classical solutions of uh, electromagnetism and gravity, we might look want to look at uh, how the symmetries in both theories map to each other. And in particular, I'm going to look at asymptotic symmetries. So we are going to focus on BMS transformations, which are uh, related to the Bondi metric. The Bondi metric is this, uh, this metric in which any asymptotically flat space time can be put in. And uh, it must satisfy also these fall-off conditions for the different coefficients. Now, if you have a metric in this form, you can study which diffeomorphisms uh, preserve the Bondi form of the metric. So even though the coefficients them themselves, they might change, uh, you can still have the same expansion in one over R. If you do that, then what you get is the, the BMS group. Uh, basically you have the Poincaré group, which of course uh, uh, acts, uh, acts trivially, but then you also have some new transformations. You have the super translations, which are trans, uh, translations of the retarded time parameter by some function of the angles. Uh, which, so if you picture this cone to be scribe plus and the lines to be constant u slices, then as a super translation, what it does is just uh, deforms the constant u slices by some uh, time fun oh, sorry, angular function. Two minutes. Thank you. You also have super rotations. Super rotations are uh, conformal transformations of on the celestial sphere, on the two sphere, which are not well defined globally. So for example, this uh, image here uh, represents a super rotation. You see that there are some points in which, in which this deformorphism is not well defined. Uh, but so now we want to use the Val double copy to relate this to something analogous in gauge or well, in electromagnetism. And of course, the most uh, similar thing that we have in electromagnetism are large, large gauge transformations, which are large, uh, which are gauge transformations that don't fall off at uh, at infinity. And indeed, if you if you use the Val double copy, uh, you can find that at least in some examples, the super rotations are related to large gauge transformations. And with that, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish. This is my, my summary slide. Uh, you, you see that uh, we've introduced the, the double copy and we've explored cases where classical solutions exhibit a double copy-like structure. 
And in the very last slide, we simply uh, try to understand how symmetries map from cage theory to, to gravity using this map. Thank you. Well, exactly perfect timing there. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, so while we're waiting for any questions, I was just going to ask, uh, what are you planning to do next? Uh, is there a new um, uh, space-time structure you were going to look at? So I think that I've, I've been doing recently is uh, trying to understand better how the, the classical maps emerge from the quantum ones. So basically, you can take a look at uh, the three-point amplitude in young Mills. And then you take the classical limit of that and you find that uh, that essentially gives you a point charge, Coulomb in the case of electromagnetism or Schwarzschild in the case of, of gravity. And so you can work out the equations so that you can obtain the classical maps directly from the amplitude maps. 